Okay, so today, <laughs> so today we are going to start our uh, lecture talking about metabolism. And so this will be the general theme of Unit 4 in Bio 180. And we can split metabolism really into two categories. And one of them, one category is going to be anabolism. And anabolism are reactions, so these are chemical reactions that are going to lead us so anabolism are reactions that are going to produce energy overall. And then they also produce polymers or more complex molecules. So they build things up. So anabol anabolic reactions build things inside the cell. And the other type of pathway that we're going to encounter is called catabolic pathways or catabolism. Okay. And what catabolism does is just the sort of opposite of anabolism. Catabolism is going to, oh shoot, we got to back up, I did the whole thing wrong. Okay, so restarting, take two, now. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to be talking about metabolism. And in our Bio 180 class, this is the beginning of Module 4. And metabolism can be defined as the sum of all the chemical reactions in the body or in the cell. We'll limit it to the cell. And so that's, that's a pretty big topic. There's actually a lot of chemical reactions that are happening inside the cell. And so we're actually going to divide it into two categories. We're going to have catabolic reactions or catabolism, and then we're going to have anabolic reactions or anabolism. And so these are on opposite sides and they're, they're kind of opposite of each other. Catabolic reactions are going to be reactions that are going to produce energy for us. Or they produce building blocks. Building blocks. Or in other words, more simple molecules. And so catabolism or catabolic reactions are breakdown reactions overall. And so catabolic reactions then produce energy, they produce building blocks. Well, what do they produce those for? Well, they produce them so that we can have anabolic reactions. And the anabolic reactions are just going to do the opposite. Anabolic reactions are going to consume energy. And they are going to use the simple molecules that we created with catabolic reactions. And they're going to build more complex molecules. And so these are going to be build-up reactions or pathways. So anabolic reactions then are going to use these building blocks and create more complex molecules. Okay? And so they're kind of related to each other in that sense. Now, before we go on, let's talk a little bit more about some terms and maybe overview where we're going in the rest of this module and just do a brief overview of where this module is headed. So when we talk about metabolism, we can 
start to illustrate what's called a biochemical pathway that looks something like this. And so in this pathway, so let's write down that this overall would be a biochemical pathway. And there's a couple of different features or components. Right here at the beginning, represented by this letter A, we are going to call that the very first reactant, or more often than not, rather than use the word reactant, we're going to use a new word called substrate, and I'll explain that in just a second. And so on this end, we're going to start with this substrate A. So this would be some kind of molecule. And then on this end, we've got another molecule, D, and we're going to call that the end product of that pathway. And then each one of these arrows right here represents a different chemical reaction that's taking place. And so in this pathway, we have several chemical reactions that are taking place. Sometimes you'll see it as a, we've drawn it as just a straight arrow. Earlier in the class, we drew the uh, representation for a chemical reaction using a double-sided arrow, implying that the reaction was reversible. Either way, it doesn't matter, but we've got three different chemical reactions in this pathway. Another word we're going to encounter a lot during this unit, if we look at B, B has an interesting relationship in that for this chemical reaction, B is the product. It's what results from that chemical reaction. But if you look at this chemical reaction, B is going to be our substrate. So it begs the question, what is B? Is it a substrate? Or is it a product? And the answer is, it's both. So we use a different term. In this case, because it's intermediate or in the middle, we just refer to B as an intermediate in this biochemical pathway. And C would also be an intermediate. Now, our chemical pathway right here, our biochemical pathway, has four different uh, substrate products or intermediates. Some pathways can be much longer than that. They could have 20, 30 different intermediates uh, and be connected to other pathways beyond that. But this just gives you an idea of what we call some of those. Now, in biochemical, notice instead of putting a chemical pathway, we put a biochemical pathway because it's happening inside of the cell. We will spend a whole day, these pathways right here, in order to occur, at body temperatures and body pH and, and less harsh conditions, these chemical reactions often require some kind of catalyst. I will represent right here. And usually the catalyst, the name of the catalyst would be written on top of the chemical reaction right here in between. And so the catalysts that we use in biochemical reactions are called enzymes. And so enzymes then catalyze the conversion from A to B, and they're necessary so we can run it under physiological conditions. So each one of these chemical reactions would have a different enzyme that catalyzes that reaction. Not only does it help the reaction go forward or occur at physiological conditions, but enzymes often regulate uh, when that reaction occurs so that it doesn't happen all the time. And so we'll spend some time talking about that. One other component that we want to draw up here has to do with what comes off or sometimes on to these. And chemical reactions not only are changing the molecules, but as the molecules change during the chemical reaction, we are also changing energy. And so energy, remember up here we said earlier that we were going to produce energy or consume energy 
in our anabolic or catabolic reactions. So energy becomes a critical component of the study of metabolism or the study of chemical reactions. And so we are going to then over the next two weeks as we study Bio 180, we are going to be looking at metabolism and these different components of metabolism. So for example, the rest of today, we are going to spend looking at energy and how we track energy and measure energy in the cell using a variable called the delta G okay, to look at energy. Then we're going to spend a day looking at enzymes and the energy of activation, that enzymes, how enzymes work, uh, what they're doing, how they catalyze chemical reactions, and also how they're regulated. We'll also spend a day talking about some important and common chemical reactions that we see uh, in many different biochemical pathways. And then we're going to start looking at some examples of anabolic and catabolic pathways. So we're going to take a catabolic pathway, of which the most common catabolic pathway that we see inside the cell is called cell respiration. And cell respiration is actually broken into several parts. We'll spend a day talking about glycolysis, and we'll spend a day talking about the citric acid cycle. And oxidative phosphorylation. And then we're going to spend another couple of days with an example of an anabolic pathway, and the anabolic pathway is also very common, we're going to use photosynthesis as our example of an anabolic pathway. And we're going to spend a day talking about what we call the light reactions of photosynthesis, and then a day talking about the Calvin cycle, which is another component of photosynthesis. And so that's going to outline basically what we're going to be doing for the rest of this unit. Okay? And that's how it all fits under this heading of metabolism. So let's go ahead over here and start talking about our first topic, free energy. Now. Many of you before in a previous science class have learned about energy. You may have learned about it even as far back as elementary school or junior high. Learning it, and you probably separated energy into two different types. You called some things kinetic energy and you called other things potential energy. We're going to introduce a new type of energy that we talk about in biology to you today and that's going to be free energy. And we'll give you a couple of different ways of looking at this and how to interpret it. But essentially, free energy is going to be viewed as the energy available to do work. And what really free energy is going to be is anytime we have a chemical reaction right here, we saw some energy coming out of the reaction, and then we saw some energy going into this particular reaction. All reactions involve some kind of transformation of energy. And that's what we call the free energy. The free energy then is represented by the symbol delta G a lot of times, but always represented by delta G. And we're going to use a couple different equations for delta G, but the first one I want to use is delta G equals the G, or the free energy of a system, of products minus the free energy of reactants. Okay? And let's talk a little bit then about what this free energy looks like and give you a little representation of it. The free energy of a system, whether it's products or reactants, is defined as follows by a man named Gibbs. So the G 
of a system is equal to the H plus T S. And so if we had reactants right here, then we'd write reactants. And let's talk a little bit about some of these terms and what they mean. So G represents, again, the free energy. We've been talking about that. H right here. H represents a term that the chemists refer to as enthalpy. Now, you learn more about enthalpy as you take your chemistry classes, but for us, we are going to consider the enthalpy to be the potential energy of the system, of the reactants, or whatever it is you're looking at. So we're going to look at enthalpy as being the total potential energy. And then we have this term over here, S. T just stands for temperature. Most people are familiar with uh, the temperature. Oops. Actually, I need to correct this. It's not plus T, S. It's going to be minus. So we've got the temperature. And then over here is probably a new term that you haven't heard before. And that's entropy. So entropy is a measure of the disorder or randomness of a system. And we'll go over these, each one in order, in just a second. But before we do that, I want to draw a little graphic here to the side to kind of illustrate what this looks like, this, particularly this equation up here. I also want to state, even though we'll go over both of these and, and the different components in this formula, they're not equal in their contribution to the free energy of a system. By and large, this will be the dog, the H, the total potential energy, is going to be the dog. And this T delta S is more commonly the tail. Okay, So both of them are going to factor into delta G, but the H typically factors more. Okay, So... This enthalpy, what does it represent? We said it's the potential energy. And I'm going to try writing this down here. Inside the cell, we find that potential energy really has two sources or two forms inside the cell. The first form is going to be in the form of what we call electrochemical gradients. And that's all I'm going to say about that. We have a whole day that we spend on electrochemical gradients later on in the course. So we're going to kind of forget about that one and focus on the second source of potential energy inside the cell, and that is chemical energy inside the bonds. So every molecule, whether it's a product or reactant, holds a certain amount of potential energy inside of its bonds. And when we do a chemical reaction, we break bonds, and that actually takes a little bit of energy to do, and then we reform them. And whether those bonds are of equivalent energy or not determines whether we need energy to make the new bonds, or whether we release energy. Okay? And so this is what we're going to focus on, is the potential energy that's held in the chemical bonds of a molecule. Now, let's come over here and say we have a chemical reaction. And so we've got a little graph that we're going to create here. And on this axis, we're going to represent energy. So the Higher up on the graph we go, the more energy we have, the lower, the less energy we have. And then on this x-axis, we're going to make a bar graph, and we're going to represent the energy of the reactants right here on this column, and then we'll represent the energy of the products on this column. Now, when we talk about 
the potential energy then, and we represent this with some kind of bar that we'll draw in a second, where does that come from? Well, it comes from a couple of factors, right? If our potential energy is held in the bonds, then doesn't it make sense that the number of bonds in a molecule becomes important? A molecule that, say, has 10 bonds in it is going to have more potential energy than one that has just two bonds. Does that make sense? Furthermore, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but not all covalent bonds are created equal. So some bonds require more energy to hold two atoms together than other bonds. And so, again, we just say that the quality of bonds is not equal. We're not going to say anything more about that. Just know that some bonds are better than others when it comes to holding potential energy. One other factor, then, that we put into this is it depends in your system how many molecules you have, right? So the number of molecules or the concentration matters, right? Now, this would make sense because if I have 50 molecules, that's going to hold more potential energy, I have more bonds, than if I had the same molecule but only had 10, or the same, the same chemical but only 10 molecules of that, right? We would say, well, one has a lot more potential energy than the other one. Just like we would say 50 horses could pull, has a lot more potential energy at pulling a wagon, say, than five horses would. Okay, same idea. So, suppose we then could represent the energy of our reactants with a column or a bar that look like this. And the idea here is each one of those molecules is contributing a certain amount of energy. And so when you add all those up, you get some kind of bar that would represent the total then potential energy. And built in here, we're ignoring this T delta S component. But in this bar, because we're looking at free energy, that's in there somewhere. We just haven't talked about it. But we have some kind of energy, free energy, associated with the reactants right here. And that's this value right there. That's the free energy of the reactants. Now, we could likewise represent the products with some kind of total free energy as well. Now the products, we're going to say that each product actually has less energy. Maybe it's a smaller molecule or something like that. But we're going to say that each one had a little bit less energy. And so when you add them all together, the total energy of products, or the G, so this represents the G of products. This represents the G of reactants. Now, when we look at this graph right here, we see that we have more energy in the reactants than we do in the products. And our chemical reaction is designed, so let's say we were doing this chemical reaction, and this represented A, and that represented B. And the whole point of this is we want A to be converted into B. That's our chemical reaction. Now, will that happen? Well, that's what the delta G tells us. If we look at this chemical reaction from the start, we notice that the reactants are up here, and then the level of energy for the products are right here. And so there's a difference between those two bars, right? Notice difference. The negative sign is the difference. And so this difference between this level and that level, that is in fact, what represents our delta G. So the delta G is not, nothing more than the difference between the total energy of the reactants, or actually the total energy of the products, minus the total energy of the reactants. Sometimes it helps on this next one. I'm going to put a number on this. Let's say that this represented, I don't know, let's just put a number and say 8, that there's 8 units of energy, whatever those units are. 
And then this one, as we look at it, we can tell that there's less. Let's just say that there's four units of energy right there. And let's come back over here to our formula and kind of plug things in. And let's see what our delta G represents. So our products were four minus our reactants are eight. And so that's going to equal a negative four for our delta G. Now, does that make sense? Yes, actually it does. Because in the course of our reaction, notice that we're going to be going downhill and we're going to be losing energy. So we would expect in a downhill reaction to create that, that we would have, we're going to give up. That's what the minus sign means. We're taking away or subtracting energy from that system. And so for a reaction to go forward, we're going to see in a second, actually requires that we have a negative delta G. Okay? And so hopefully this explains a little bit of this formula and what we're going through. If we have high amounts of energy in the products, the reaction is going to, so to speak, go energetically downhill. We'll have a delta G, and that delta G will be negative. Okay? So we've been learning about H, our enthalpy term. We've learned what potential energy exists inside the cell. And we've learned about the factors that, that determine the chemical energy bonds that are found in this system, like these reactants and products. And we've discussed why, what the delta G actually is. Let's look at this term. Now let's return and talk about this uh, T, or mostly we'll talk about this idea of entropy for a second, just so we can understand that. And then we'll move on and come back to delta G and talk more about what delta G means inside the cell. So let's come over here and talk about entropy, which is denoted by S, the, the letter S. So entropy, we already said, is equal to the randomness or disorder of a system. Now, what does randomness or disorder have to do with energy? Well, to understand what entropy has to do with energy, we have to go back to what we call the laws of thermodynamics. Okay, where thermo means energy and dynamics means change of. So these are the laws of the changing of energy. The first law, we're not going to spend a lot of time on, but it's important. The first law simply says that energy, at least inside the universe, can be neither created nor destroyed. Okay? So the energy can, the, the basic amount of energy that exists right now at this very moment in time in the universe is all there is. It never goes away and it never comes up again. The amount of energy in the universe, at least, is finite and fixed and constant. You can't destroy it and you can't make new energy. However, you can transform it, but can be transformed. And this is where we often get our idea of losing or gaining energy in a system. So we can transform it. We can take potential energy, a ball or a rock sitting on top of a hill, and we can convert it into kinetic energy, that ball rolling down the hill. Okay, And then it can stop. And so we can transform energy. We can take energy from gasoline, chemical energy in gasoline molecules. We can put them inside of an automobile and combust them and convert that into forward motion, energy of motion or kinetic energy. Right? So we can convert energy. We just can't create it or destroy it. We can, I guess we could, we could destroy one type of energy in favor of creating another type of energy is how we might say that. So that's the first law. The second law, 
simply says this. Energy transformations are not 100% efficient. Okay? So, this one doesn't seem like such a big deal, but it has really big consequences. So let's talk about it for a second. Let's start with this idea we just mentioned as an example. We could take gasoline and we could transform that into motion or our drive. So movement of car. So we have potential energy in the bonds of the gasoline. We talked about that already. And then we're going to transform that in this arrow into the movement of our car. However, we never get all of the energy out. This arrow implies that we would get 100%, but we never do. We always have some kind of loss. In other words, we start out with one type of energy. We do get movement of our car, but we also get another type of energy, and that's heat. Not all of the energy in that gasoline is going to moving your car forward. A lot of it, and in the case of uh, gasoline engines, a significant amount, a 60%, of the energy in the gasoline is actually going to generating the heat. That's why your car engine, when you put your hand on the hood, is so hot. Because a lot of that energy is just being lost as heat. Now, what is heat? Heat, the physicists tell us, is random thermal motion. Okay. In other words, we've got molecules. We're made out of molecules. The air around us is made out of molecules. And what heat is, is the motion, it's a measurement of how fast those particles are moving. Whether it's in our body or whether it's in the air, heat is random thermal motion. The trick about heat, we would say that it is disordered energy. Heat is actually the least efficient, or we could also, if we wanted to go to extremes, say heat is the most useless form of energy. Now, I know living in Rexburg, as many of you do, that might seem a little counterintuitive. Heat is useless? You know, you're, you're running heaters and you're making fires and all to build heat. It doesn't seem useless. The problem with heat on a biological or, or from a thermodynamic standpoint is heat can never be stored. If you think about it, so you, you heat up your apartments, but as soon as you turn that heater off, what immediately happens to that heat? Even if you're a well-insulated apartment, it dissipates. It goes through the walls of that apartment, out inside to the wider environment, and eventually, think about it, it heats up that outer environment and eventually goes up through the ozone and through the atmosphere, and it heats up space. That random motion as your hot molecules inside your apartment bounce against other molecules. They lose some of their kinetic energy as transferring it to other molecules. And so the heat always dissipates. It doesn't matter if it comes from your car or your apartment or you. Every transformation of energy that you do, whether it's you eating a Snickers bar and converting it into chemical energy or muscle movement or the gasoline converted into mechanical energy in the movement of your car is always producing heat, and that heat is always dissipating and slowly warming up the universe by whatever infinitesimal uh, scale or point that you look at. And so no matter what, no matter how well you insulate, you always lose heat. It becomes random, disordered, spread out. And so you can't, this is why the, they say that it's not 100, well, no reaction is 100% efficient. We're always, in any transformation, losing a certain degree of heat. And so every energy transformation in the universe that happens slowly leads to greater disorder, 
or randomness in the universe. So one of the corollaries of the second law of, the, of thermodynamics is that the universe is, albeit slowly, disordering. The universe is slowly falling apart or becoming more random. We start out with highly organized energy in whatever form, whether you look at the sun and this burning mass of gases, well, the sun is slowly disordering. And so is the Earth and everything on Earth. This applies not only toward energy, but Einstein tells us that energy and mass are equivalent based on as E equals mc squared. So this happens with mass as well. So you look at something like the pyramids. If left alone, what happens to the pyramids over time? Well, they disorder. Everything then on Earth in the universe is slowly disordering due to the implications of the second law. This brings up an interesting controversy uh, for living organisms because the universe is slowly randomizing or disordering. And in fact, that is a driving process. So right here, everything disorders. The second law says it just happens. That's a movement. If we want to convert something into something else, randomness or entropy can drive that. If we want it to disorder, we don't have to put any energy into it. It just naturally does it. That's the link between energy and entropy. Now, again, coming back to biological, biological life, we have a problem in that if you consider, let's say, me standing before you as really a pretty highly organized organism, right? Uh, and, and actually, I seem to be disobeying the laws of entry. Entropy says over time everything disorders, but I'm not. I started out as a little embryo, an egg, a single egg, not very ordered. And I grew in a very organized and ordered fashion until I'm composed of, they say, over 30 trillion cells, all organized and functioning. So I seem to be disobeying this idea that the universe is disordering. How does that work? And so that brings us to the discussion of what we call islands of low Entropy. Me being highly organized does actually not disobey the second law of thermodynamics any more than the flying of an airplane or a jet disobeys the law of gravity. It just uses a second law to overcome the effects of gravity, at least temporarily. In the same way, I overcome the second law of entropy temporarily, but only at the expense of the universe. Let me explain what I mean by that. In order for me to be highly organized, what do I have to keep doing? I have to keep taking in energy in the form of wheat or cows or chickens or whatever it might be. And in fact, when I take in, so when I eat that cow, when I eat that steak, I am disordering that cow or that steak in order to use that energy to keep myself organized and ordered. The same thing happened, in fact, so while I may be becoming ordered, the cow is becoming disordered. And over my lifetime to maintain this ordered state, I have to break down a lot more cows and chicken and wheat. And so the universe ultimately has a net loss of order and efficiency and of order and randomness. Does that make sense? Ultimately, we can tie this back to where did the wheat come or where did the cow come from? The cow got its order and organization from breaking down, say, wheat and grass. Well, the wheat and grass got its order and organization from breaking down the sun. The sun is disordering. It's sending out the product of that disorder, the energy transformation or the light waves that hit the planet, uses that light. To build, up, uh, to build up sugar using photosynthesis. And, and so that starts the whole thing. So life on the planet 
is driven ultimately by the sun disordering. Sun's part of the universe. The universe is disordering. So we can have islands of low entropy, but the universe itself is slowly disordering. And we have to continue to take in energy or we ourselves start order disordering as well. As soon as a body stops taking in energy, we call that death, it decomposes. Okay? So that's entropy and how it applies into this equation. So again, we're not going to talk too much about it. This tends to be the tail in this equation, but it does have uh, an impact in certain cases. There are cases where it becomes a large component. Uh, for example, in uh, the re chemical reaction of dynamite or TNT, right? Then you have a very large disordering or randomness when that reaction takes place, and that drives, that's one of the reasons why the explosion of TNT, that chemical reaction, is so explosive, so much force, because this becomes a very large tail in those instances. So, things that break down or disorder have a natural driving energy behind them, in the, or have entropy will drive processes forward and have an effect on the delta G if it's creating more randomness or disorder. Likewise, if we create more organization, that's usually going to require more energy because we're fighting against that idea of entropy or randomness. Okay, so now we've talked about delta G a little bit. We've talked about uh, H component. We've talked about the TNS component. Let's come back and erase this then. and return to our discussion of free energy. And let's consider a couple of different examples and what we mean by free energy and how we talk about free energy in our discussion of metabolism. So, we already gave some cases we show you to draw a graph over there on that side of the board. Let's draw another one here. Let's consider a case where our reactants, the energy in our, our reactants, so here's our reactants. Again, we're going to this graph, we've got energy on this axis. And then we have our products. Okay. Now, so in this example, we'll call this scenario one. Okay, so we have a chemical reaction. The energy, the G of the reactants, in this case is low, and the energy of the products is high. So in this case, we still have a delta G. Notice that our delta G exists from, again, we're going to define it the same way. From here to here, that's the delta G. However, our sign is going to be a little bit different. In this case, the reaction from reactants to products is going uphill. Can you see? In other words, this has a lower energy on the starting end than what we are expecting on the, on the product side. If we were to plug this, again, let's maybe put in some numbers to this. Let's say this is maybe, uh, we'll say that's a 6, and this is maybe a 2 over here. And we look over at our formula over there, and we say that the delta G, or the G of products minus the G of reactants. That's going to equal 6 minus 2, and we get a positive 4 in this case. And so we would say, this brings up a more, more general example, a rule that let's write that up. So if delta G in this case is greater than 0, 
meaning it's a positive number. We have a special term for this. We call this an endergonic reaction. So when delta G is a positive number, we call that an endergonic reaction. And in this case, we would say that the reactants are more stable. And this is what you're going to often hear the free energy used for. The universe, one of the things that the universe is trying to do, not only go toward entropy, but anything in the universe tries to seek out low free energy. And that's what drives things. It wants to be at a low free energy, whatever the system is. You want to be a low free energy, right? If you're out running a marathon, you go home, you want to take a nap or sit down on a couch and watch SpongeBob. We're always seeking low free energy. And molecules and systems made up of molecules are the same way. They seek low free energy. The, the lower your free energy is, the more stable, the less likely to change that system is. And so this idea of free energy and stability becomes an important one. And in this case, because the reactants have the lower free energy, the reactants are more stable. And so this is an endergonic reaction. We would also say that this reaction is non-spontaneous. Spontaneity in chemistry and biology has a little bit different meaning than it does outside, say, in our apartments or in our normal social interactions. Um, spontaneous doesn't mean that it happens quickly or, or slowly. It just means that, or non-spontaneous means that it doesn't happen. Uh, so if it were spontaneous, that means it would happen. You wouldn't have to do anything to the system. It would eventually change all on its own. But in this case, this particular reaction going from this reactant to this product is going to be non-spontaneous, meaning it will not happen. Not happening. And when I say not happening, I mean ever. Okay? So... A positive delta G is not going to happen ever. You might be looking at it, though, and sometimes we can re said reactions are reversible. The reverse reaction would. Okay. So the reverse reaction of products going to reactants would happen. Okay, and we could just switch that sign. So that's one example. What's another example? Well, the other example looks a lot like what we had on the board before. So in our second example, let's take our reactants, and we're going to add our reactants there, they have a lot of energy. And then there's our products. And again, we have this difference in our initial conditions between the two. That represents our delta G, the difference between those two levels. Now notice in this hand, going from our left to right, we are going downhill. That's going to mean that this delta G is going to be a negative number like we saw before. Okay? And so now we have a situation where we have delta G is less than zero. It's a negative number. So in this case, what are the, we would call this a exergonic reaction. In this case, we would say now that the products, whatever is over here, products energetically are more stable. We have a more stable product. And we would say that this reaction is spontaneous. We don't need to change or do anything to this reaction. It will naturally go forward. Reactants will naturally convert into products, we don't have to do anything to it.
and that would be a spontaneous reaction. So it moves forward. Moves forward. Okay, so this would be an exergonic reaction. Now, let's come back over here. Let's erase this. Hopefully you recorded that down. So this was example two. Now, if we look at example two, we said that this was a spontaneous reaction. Let's consider one more scenario or example. If this is spontaneous, that means that reactants over here are going to convert into products. Now remember that this was made up of however many molecules, each with its own energy uh, amount that it was contributing to this column, right? Now as the reaction goes forward, what happens to the height of this column right here? I can see some of you shaking, or, you know, pointing and shaking your heads. And your, the idea is that as we start converting these molecules into products, that means we have less energy over here, right? So this column is going to go down. Meanwhile, over here on products, as they convert into products, what happens to the height of this column? as the chemical reaction goes forward. I see some of you pointing, and you're saying, well, this column is going to go up. And that's exactly right. Now, depending on how big the block of energy is for each molecule, they'll go up at different rates, go up or down at different rates. So they don't necessarily go at the same rate, but this column will go down, this column will go up, until what happens? And that's our next example. So there could be several possibilities. It could keep going until the red column completely disappears. Uh, it could keep going until the blue blows up the chart. But what actually happens is that as the reaction proceeds, we reach a point at which the energy level, and let's not forget that, that we are always, we're not talking about the number of red molecules or blue molecules, we're talking about the energy of red versus blue. And so we reach this point at which the energy of the reactants is equal to the energy of the products. I think I better draw this a little bit more carefully. And so remember we've been saying that the delta G was equal to the difference between the products and reactants. But when the two are equal, then delta G at this point is neither positive or negative. It's exactly equal to zero. And that gives us a third example or scenario where delta G equals zero. And we refer to this as equilibrium. That reaction, once it reaches equilibrium, there's no more change. There might be some, we call it dynamic equilibrium in the sense that some red molecules might be becoming blue molecules, but blue molecules are running in reverse to become red molecules at exactly the same rate. So while there might be some interchange, the levels of these two of products and reactants remains constant and the same. Equilibrium, we often think of equality, equilibrium as kind of a good thing, right? All things being equal. However, in a chemical or a biochemical setting, equilibrium is bad. Because at equilibrium, there's no work being done. We don't have any free energy. None is being required, but we're not producing any either. And so the body tries to avoid equilibrium. Cells try to avoid equilibrium. 
equilibrium. Okay? Because no work, no useful work can be done at equilibrium. Okay? So that gives us three settings. Uh, and you'll need to learn these words endergonic, exergonic, and equilibrium. And identify looking at graphs or be able to talk about and explain what these words mean in relation to delta G being positive or negative or equal to zero. Now, the next question that comes up, we have seen what delta G is. We've talked about ways to describe the delta G of a reaction using exergonic or endergonic, depending on whether we have a negative delta G or a positive delta G. The next question that comes up with delta G and free energy is, can we change can we change the delta G of a reaction? Is the delta G of a reaction fixed? And the answer to that is yes. Yes, we can change the delta, rea delta G of a reaction. And then the follow-up question is how? How do you cha change delta G? So if you have a chemical reaction that has a positive delta G, is there a way that the body or a chemist can manipulate that to somehow turn it into a negative delta G so that the reaction will move forward? Because if it's a positive delta G, remember we said it's not happening. And that's true. Positive delta Gs cannot and will not ever happen. That does not mean that the reaction can't happen. It just can't happen when it has a positive delta G. If we can somehow change the delta G of that reaction to a negative delta G, even a little negative delta G, then it will go forward and we can produce that chemical reaction. So, how do we do that? Well, the first method we have actually already discussed. We can change the amount or concentration of products or reactants. And we can affect the delta G that way. To explain this, let's look at one of our little charts that we've gotten used to drawing. And we write energy right here. And let's take an example. In fact, let's go back to the example we just finished with, where we had a chemical reaction, and it was at equilibrium, or at least as close to equilibrium as I can draw on the board. So here's our products. Here's our reactants. It's at equilibrium, so we know that the delta G for this reaction is 0. And that's pretty easy. Can we tell, change the delta G? Sure. What if I took and added more reactants? What if I just dumped a bunch of reactant into my vessel chamber or whatever it is? Then the energy goes up. Now I have, let's see if you can remember how to do this. I have a delta G present. There's a difference between the energy of those products and reactants. Is that delta G positive or negative? Well, we're going downhill, so that's a negative delta G. And the reaction would proceed in that direction. So I went from delta G equals 0 to delta G is a negative number and would move forward. That's not the only way I can do it, though. Look at it, for example, and see if you might be able to think about some way other than adding reactants that I could get the same result of moving the reaction toward a negative delta G. Take a second and just look at that. So here's the other way. I could add products. We're not going to do that. I could also 
remove so I could remove product out of that. I could somehow pull away product and then I would still again have this scenario where I have a separation and I have now a negative delta G that's a downhill. So removing product has the same effect as adding reactant. Both of them create a negative delta G. Likewise in reverse if I erase these, if I add product, so if I add a whole bunch of product right here, so if I add product, I now create a positive delta G, and that is an uphill, actually we should put the arrow this way, that is an uphill energetic process, and so that would be endergonic, or non-spontaneous. That's not going to happen. So adding, depending on whether you want the reaction to go or not, if you want the reaction to go forward, adding product is a bad uh, strategy. Okay, That's going to be the opposite of what you want. You could also remove reactant, and that would also tend to make that an uphill process. So all we're saying is that we can change the amount of products or reactants. In application, if we come over here, we can kind of see a cool application of this. If we look at our metabolic pathway, we have A to B. As this chemical reaction goes forward, the levels of A will go down, the levels of B will go up until eventually they hit equilibrium and this reaction would stop. Except for in the body, look at what's happening. B is naturally being removed because this chemical reaction is going to take B and decrease the amount in favor of growing the amount of C. So as C goes up, B goes down, which means more A can be converted into B, and so we're going to drag the molecules through this pathway by increasing and decreasing. Okay? And that's how metabolism works inside the body. So the body uses this strategy a lot. The cell will often increase the amount of pro uh, reactants, decrease the amount of products. Overall, in your body, you do this all the time. This is why you eat things like donuts, right? You are continually adding new reactants to cell respiration, building up A, and then you're getting rid of waste products at the other end, the Ds. This is what you do when you breathe off CO2. You take in donuts, you breathe off CO2. That's the waste product of donuts, okay? And so, this is commonly used in the body for energy. The second strategy is not commonly used, at least not for us. You can change the temperature. The easiest way to explain this one is not with this graph, but looking at the formula. The actual Gibbs formula, we kind of went over this earlier, is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. And we've already said that the idea here is to get to a negative delta G, right? That would make it spontaneous. Well, if we look over here, temperature is in front of the delta S, but it's also behind this negative sign. So as temperature increases, delta G becomes more negative for the simple reason that if T became, let's say T went from 5 to 10, that would double this negative sign. So whatever H was, if I take a negative 5 and change it to a negative 10, that makes this more negative. Okay? So increase in temperature, increasing T, makes delta G more negative. And likewise, a decrease in temperature makes delta G less negative. Okay? And that's the temperature component. So you can change the temperature and affect delta G that way. This is not a strategy that most organisms use because we tend to keep ourselves through homeostasis 
at a, at a very even uh, controlled temperature of 37 degrees Celsius for humans. And so we're not using changing temperature uh, much. However, there are things, for example, when you bake, when you cook something, that's one of the things that you're doing. By changing the temperature, you're changing the delta G in that, uh, for those chemical reactions. When you take organic chemistry later on, you're often going to stick your chemical reactions in an oven or underneath a Bunsen burner, and that's what you're doing. You are, to some degree, overcoming what's called the energy of activation. We'll learn about that later. But you're also helping that delta G to become more negative, drive that reaction forward. The final method that we're going to use is another really important one that's used in the body. We can change the concentrations. We can change the temperature. We can also, we're going to call this one just change the reaction. And we're doing that by a process called reaction coupling. So to explain reaction coupling, let's come back over here to this side of the room. We'll rewrite three, reaction coupling. And let's explain this one by looking at a real life example. In your cells, you have an amino acid called glutamate that we're going to abbreviate as GLU. And there's a necessary chemical reaction where you take a molecule of ammonia and you add it to glutamate and you form the amino acid glutamine, GLN, and then you get some water here in the process. And this has a delta G is equal to a positive 3.4. And this is uh, kilocalories per mole. Now, what's the problem with this? Well, it's got a positive delta G. So it's not happening, ever. The problem with that is that we actually need glutamine. It's an essential amino acid. We need it to make proteins in our cell, but the delta G is saying, nah, -uh, you can't make it. But we have to make it. And in fact, we do make it. So how do we make it? We do that by adding a second reaction. So we're going to take ATP plus water, and that makes adenosine diphosphate. It's the difference here, diphosphate versus triphosphate. And in the process, we lose, we'll call this PI. It means inorganic phosphate or just a, a ion, a phosphate ion. And so that's our second chemical reaction. And this one, fortunately, has a delta G equal to a negative 7.2 kcals per mole. So this one is actually really quite exergonic. This one gives up a lot of energy. This one was requiring energy. It was endergonic. All coupling does is it says, well, let's just add them. <laughs> If we add the reaction together, then we get a new reaction made up of both of them. And the laws of thermodynamics also allow us then to add the delta G for those as well. So when we do this, we get ATP plus glutamine plus ammonia. Right here, my waters, notice I've got a water here on the left-hand side, but I also have a water here on the right-hand side. So those are going to simply cross-cancel. I'm not going to write those down. And over on this side, I'm going to write my glutamine plus ADP plus inorganic phosphate. So now I have a new reaction. This is a composite, but it's different from either of my parent reactions.
and now I can add this one, and so I get a negative 3.8 kcals per mole. That reaction is exergonic, so this reaction will happen, and that's how I'm going to get my glutamine. It's going to come at the expense of losing my ATP. And so that's how we couple reactions. To couple any reaction, if you were doing a problem with this, what you're going to do, there are a couple rules that you follow. The first is you write one reaction on top of another. So write reactions one above the other. Now, it turns out when you write those reactions one above the other, hopefully you have one of them with a positive uh, delta G and hopefully the other one has a negative. If they're both positive, you're really in for trouble, <laughs> okay, because they're going to become more positive even. If you run into that scenario, there's a simple trick that you can do. Switch one of them. Reverse reactions. If you reverse the reaction, then you invert the sign. The magnitude of delta G stays the same, but the sign switches. Okay? So, for example, I could have written this up as glutamine plus water goes to glutamate plus NH3, and that would have a delta G equal to a negative 3.4 kcals per mole. I know you might be saying, well, why didn't you just write that one up then? Because I didn't want glutamate. I wanted glutamine. <laughs> that was the reactant I wanted. So you can reverse the reactions. Another rule in here is if you double or triple or whatever, if you double the reaction, then you double delta G. So what that means is if I double this and said two glutamines, two waters, two glutamates, and two NH3s, then this would change to 6.8. I would double the delta G. That's the other thing that you can do as you're doing these types of coupling reactions. If one ATP wasn't sufficient to carry out this reaction, all right, then do it with two ATPs. Okay? And, and there are chemical processes when you make a protein. You need a lot of ATP to make something big like a protein. So how do you make it? You just use a lot of ATPs. Okay. Uh, then step four gets pretty easy. You add all the reactants and products. And step five is you add the delta G together. And so those are kind of the five steps that you look at or rules when you're coupling reactions up on the board. This tells us how you would couple the reaction. So this is kind of the math, the paper version of it. Uh, but a lot of times it's hard to go from this, like, okay, I get it. I can add reactions. But the cell doesn't have a brain. It doesn't know how to add. It doesn't have a little calculator in there adding. How do things actually work inside the cell? Well, let's draw our energy chart again, and let's look at that with, some, with this as a real example and see what's happening. So again, here we have our energy, and we've got our reactants. And so what we're going to do is we're going to represent ATP. ATP has a very high energy associated with it, potential energy. We'll talk about why in a second. So Here's my ATP as a reactant. And then glutamine, or sorry, glutamate, is somewhere down here. And that's part of the problem is because glutamine is up here. 
And what this tells us is that the glutamate is actually more stable than the glutamine is. That's why it wouldn't go forward. This is an uphill reaction, and that doesn't happen. If you're glutamate, and you're at a low energy, you're more stable, why the heck would you want to become glutamine? That's not going to happen. Why would you do that? Right? That's why it's uphill. It doesn't make sense. So how do we make it happen? This is what the coupling is really doing. ATP up here is very high energy. And it has to do with the fact that it has these three phosphates on it. What ATP does is it gets together with glutamate. And the ATP essentially says, look, I've got this phosphate I want to get rid of. Glutamate, you take the phosphate. Well, glutamate's at low energy. Why would it take a phosphate? It doesn't want to do that. But ATP is at such high energy, the glutamate's like, no, I don't want the phosphate. I'm not taking it. ATP says, no, you're taking it. Slam. And it just gives it the phosphate. What that does, glutamate then, it got that phosphate. That means we added bonds to glutamate. What did we tell you earlier about when you have more bonds on a molecule, what happens to its potential energy? It goes up. And we're not only adding more bonds, but remember we said bonds have qualities to them, certain qualities. So we're adding a lot of high energy bonds. So we create this new intermediate. It's less energetic than ATP was, but it's more energetic than glutamate was. And that's called glutamate phosphate. Now notice what happened. When we added the phosphate by force to glutamate, it becomes glutamate phosphate. Now what can happen with this conversion? Now we can run downhill. Glutamate phosphate has more potential energy. So now this reaction runs downhill. And that's what the coupling is actually doing inside the cell. We are going to take this phosphate. ATP is coming downhill. Glutamate's going uphill, but ATP is coming downhill. And that overall balance is favorable. We lose more energy here than we gain here. Now we create this high energy intermediate that can flow downhill to create the glutamine that we need. That's what energy coupling does, is taking some kind of energetic uh, reactant and using it to increase the energy of a product. It's actually happening in two steps. The first is the formation of glutamate phosphate, then the formation of glutamine. We don't actually see that when we're adding the formula together, that intermediate step, but that's what's happening inside of the cell. And that's what energy coupling looks like. Okay? And so this would be our products over here. Somewhere over here, we've got ADP as a product that went downhill also. Okay? And that's how uh, reaction coupling or what reaction coupling looks like inside of the cell. And that is another very common way of changing the delta G inside of the cell. So we do this a lot. And we're going to see in the chemical reactions that we go through when we talk about glycolysis, when we talk about uh, photosynthesis, uh, the citric acid cycle, we're going to see these types of energy transformations and couplings taking place. One more thing that I want to talk to you about. So our last topic is let's focus in on this as ATP because when we do these coupling reactions and we're trying to make a negative delta G for some process, uh, ATP is going to be one of the primary drivers of that change. So let's look at ATP and find out why we're going to use that as the main coupling re reaction inside of the cell. So we've got we've got this reaction here. This is referred to as ATP hydrolysis. Okay? or the splitting of ATP with water. And that's why you have water in this reaction. So what is it about ATP that makes its hydrolysis so special? 
if we were to draw the structure of ATP, we'll draw this out quickly. We learned about this earlier. So ATP, remember, is a nucleotide. And so we have, here's our nitrogenous base, adenosine. That's the A part. Uh, here we have our ribose sugar. So we have an OH here. It's ATP, not de deoxy. Ribose would, not, would just have an H here, not the OH. And then we have, this is our triple phosphate. So we have one phosphate right here, another phosphate, and a third phosphate. And the key behind the energetics of ATP has nothing to do with the ribose and adenosine. These are actually just handles. This is how enzymes and other proteins recognize and grab onto the energy. This is just a handle. The energy is coming from this triple phosphate. And what's happening is we've got these four negative charges on that phosphate inside the cell. At, at about a pH of 7, there's a, uh, four negative charges. Remember that like charges, we learned early in our chemistry uh, sections or modules, that like charges repel each other. And so you, you can't have a lot of negative charges real close together. And yet that is exactly what's happening with this phosphate molecule. It's got four negative charges all squeezed together inside of a relatively small space. And the best way I can explain this is that it's going to be similar to, say, taking three, uh, we'll use BYU football linemen as an example. And we're going to take three really large, and we're just going to say really homophobic BYU linemen. We're going to stick them in a really tiny closet. We're just going to pack them all in there. Just shove them and then uh, slam, you know, hit on the door a couple times, slam them in there. And that's going to represent what this phosphate is, those four negative charges being placed in a really small constricted space. Now think about that for a second. They're in there. You can hear them rustling around, uncomfortable. Does any one of you want to go up and sort of turn that door handle? And hopefully the answer is no way, because as soon as you turn that door handle, boom, that door is going to come out with a lot of explosive force. And at least one of those charges is going to come out of there, right? Because it doesn't like being packed together. That's what's happening with ATP. Remember earlier we said ATP was taking that phosphate, went up to glutamate. Here, take my phosphate. No, I don't want your phosphate. Take my phosphate. I'm giving it up. Because it can do that. Because by removing this bond and getting rid of that phosphate, we are able to separate two of those negative charges from the two over here. And energetically, that is super favorable. So this bond right here, they often refer to it as a high energy bond. In biology, you always hear about breaking the high energy bond in ATP. It's referring to this bond. And what they really should say is not necessarily that it's high energy, but that it's really unstable. And we said earlier that stability and energy are connected. If you're unstable, you have a really high energy in you. So this bond is really easily broken and transferred. And that's why ATP has so much energy. And when it transfers this phosphate group to another molecule, whether it's glutamate or whether it's a protein, it transfers then potential energy to that molecule. And that causes change. Right? It might potentiate that new molecule to accept some other chemical reaction to create glutamine. It might cause, if you're a protein and you get phosphorylated, it will often cause what we call a conformational shift. So the shape of that protein will change in response to that phosphate addition. But whatever happens, the, law, the transfer of this phosphate causes work. 
to be done. It causes coupling of some kind of energetic reaction. One final point that I want to make about ATP. If you go back and think about your nucleotides, remember that the energy of ATP is located not in the A part, but in the P part. So a lot of times, like in high school and, and uh, at lower levels, we always teach that ATP is the energy currency of the cell. And that's accurate. ATP is a slight majority of the energy of the cell. But that means that there's also other forms of energy. And notice that while well, we've been talking about ATP, what if you were to take its close cousin, GTP? Does GTP have energy? You bet. It has exactly the same energy, because it has three phosphates also, as ATP does. It just has a different handle. It has a guanosine handle instead of an adenosine handle. But the potential for energy is exactly the same. What about our other nucleotides? How about CTP? Does it have as much energy? You bet. How about UTP? You bet. And while ATP is very common in certain reactions, we will also, as you become uh, more educated, as you dive deeper and deeper into cellular processes, you find out that GTP plays a huge role in the energetics of the cell, particularly in regulation of activity. In fact, a little bit later on in the class, we're going to look at cell signaling, and we're going to see where GTP is going to act as an energy source in some of our cell signaling processes. CTP and UTP are also going to play roles. They're usually playing the roles in uh, building certain molecules. They have a different mechanism of working, but they are used as energy sources inside the cell, albeit less common. You have to really dive deep <laughs> to find these guys used in energy, in carbohydrate processing and some other mechanisms. Point is, though, ATP is not the only source of energy in the cell. We do use other nucleotides inside the cell because they contain the same energy in their triphosphate uh, moieties or structures. And that will conclude our discussion of metabolism for today. We'll come back and next time talk about enzymes and chemical reactions. Thank you.